Welcome to iLecture Online. Now, we know there's no real way to derive the Schrodinger equation. There's no mathematical correct way to do that. In several places, we have to kind of take a leap of faith and hope that we were correct in doing so. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the traditional wave equation, oh, right here, the traditional wave equation of a wave, and see how we can morph that into a wave equation that can then represent the Schrodinger equation. First of all, this is the general mechanical equation. We have an amplitude, the cosine of kx minus omega t, so that it's position and time dependent. Omega is the angular frequency, and k is the wave number, defined over here. We eventually want to end up with something that looks like this. In other words, we're going to connect this to our classical wave equation. Of course, when we pull out a minus 1, we reverse the position of these two, and then we have the correct format. And then we'll continue developing it a little bit more so that we can eventually turn this equation as a function of energy and momentum using these conversions. First of all, let's go ahead and replace k and omega by what they're equal to. So we can write that y is a function of x and t. It can be written as a times the cosine of, instead of k, we write 2 pi over lambda times x minus omega, which can be written as 2 pi f times t. Next thing what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both the numerator and denominator here by f. Let's see what we get. y of x and t is equal to a times the cosine of 2 pi f x over f times lambda. So I multiply both the top and the bottom by f, which is fine, minus 2 pi f t. Next, I realize I have a 2 pi f t over here. I can factor that out. So I can write this as y of x and t is equal to a times the cosine of 2 pi f times x over f times lambda minus t. And then I realize that for waves, the frequency times the wavelength is equal to the velocity, and 2 pi f is equal to omega. I can then write this as y as a function of x and t is equal to a times the cosine of omega times x over v minus t. And now I have the wave equation in terms of v and t, velocity and time and position, which then, when you realize that this can be expressed in terms of, of course, if I take this right here and come over here, I can say that this can be written as y is equal to a times the cosine of omega times v, x over v, x over v minus t, and that would be plus i times the sine of omega times x over v minus t, like that. So notice if we then take only the real part of this function, we have what we have over here. And then the imaginary part, of course, is not needed in a real wave equation like the wave on a string, but is indeed required when we deal with wave functions in the quantum mechanical world. So then what we did was we reversed the order of these, put a minus sign in there, and now what we're going to do is we're going to replace some variables here. We're going to have E, the energy of a particle, is equal to H times F. And the wavelength of a particle is H divided by P. This is what we know as the de Broglie wavelength of a particle, but there's one thing you might have some problems with. A particle only has energy like this h times the frequency, h being Planck's constant, if it's a photon. That is not the energy of a real particle. But if we make that leap of faith and say, well, we knew that the wavelength of a photon is h divided by the momentum, can't we then also go backwards and say, well, if the energy of a photon is this, can we not call that the energy of a particle? And move forward to that and see what happens. So you can see there's some fundamental problems here. However, it turns out that in the end, if the wave function we end up with actually properly describes the particles at the quantum mechanic level, we've achieved what we're trying to achieve. Remember, there is a very fine line between photons and small particles, and sometimes we can cross that bridge that way. So what we're going to do here is 
we're going to take omega and turn that back into 2 pi f. So we can write y is equal to a times e to the minus i times 2 pi f. And we're going to take v and replace it by the frequency times the wavelength. So times, that would be t minus x over, that would be frequency times wavelength. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply the frequency inside the parentheses. So we can say that y is equal to a e times minus i 2 pi times f times t minus f times x over f times lambda. And of course these f's cancel out. And then we're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator in both cases here, in both terms, by h. So we have y is equal to a e to the minus i times 2 pi times f h t over h minus h x over h lambda. And then we can factor out an h in the denominator and put it over here. So this can be written as y is equal to a e to the minus i 2 pi over h times f h t minus h x over lambda. Now here we need to realize a few things, and we've already written a couple of them there. I'm going to write one more thing. We know that h bar is equal to h divided by 2 pi, or 1 over h bar is equal to 2 pi over h. So first of all, we're going to have 2 pi over h, that's the same as 1 over h bar. That's a shorthand way of writing h over 2 pi. F times h, remember that's the frequency of a photon, but it can be equivalent to the frequency of a small particle, so we're going to replace that by the energy of a particle. And then h over lambda, over here, let's take a look at this. If we write p over here and h over lambda there, we can say that the momentum is equal to h over lambda, and so we can replace h over lambda by p, the momentum of the particle. And finally, we can write that y is equal to a, the amplitude, times e to the minus i, times 1 over h bar, so it's i divided by h bar, times the energy of the particle times time minus the momentum of the particle times x. And this is the format of the equation they were looking for in order to be able to produce the Schrodinger equation. It had to be a function in terms of the energy of the particle and the momentum of the particle, and it had to be time and position dependent. So if we want to actually add that over here, we can say that y as a function of position and time can be written like this. So it's, it's dependent on time and position, but it also has the energy and the momentum involved so that we can actually turn that into a Hamiltonian and we can come up with a really good equation for that Schrodinger had in mind to describe the motion of small particles in quantum mechanics. So that was kind of the leaps of faith that they took. They didn't exactly follow this exact same procedure, but something similar to that to come up with an equation that they would be able to use. It was quite a job. They managed. Now the biggest task, of course, for them still was, once we have the equation, how do we know it's correct? How do we know it's valid? But over the years, experimental results have shown that the equations held up very strongly against all of the critics, so to speak, and all of the questions that people posed. Can you indeed do this? Is this indeed valid? Experiment has borne it out. So stay tuned and we'll show you the final derivation of Schrodinger equation and how it's actually used. And that's how we do that.